Good morning. Welcome to Word of Life Church Online. Uh, this is now quarantine Sunday number seven. Not quite sure when we'll be gathered together and exactly what that'll look like. Uh, it'll happen again, but I can tell you Word of Life Church will be prudent. We'll be careful. Uh, not because we're not eager to gather together, we sure are, but because... Um, Caring for the most vulnerable is a Christian ethic because we're called to love our neighbor as mm-hmm. ourselves, right? Amen. So that's why we continue to do this like this. Um, so it's quarantine Sunday number seven for those of you keeping score. But it's a very special day for Perry and me because today is our 40th wedding anniversary. Way back, May 3rd, 1980. 1980. I said I'd do... You did too. We have, and it's been 40 years now. In some ways, it seems like yesterday. In some ways. So, you know, what do you do when it's uh, your 40th anniversary and it falls on a Sunday? Do you just get up and preach a sermon? <laughs> no, you don't do that. So I thought we would just sit down and, and have a conversation with you. Um, it is the fourth Sunday of Easter also. And so on the fourth Sunday of Easter, the theme is Jesus as the Good Shepherd. Mm-hmm. So we have the gospel reading from John 10, and then we, we heard Psalm 23. And so I thought that Perry and I would have a discussion, a conversation that you can listen in on. And if we want to put a, you know, a title on this conversation, I think I would call it Living the 23rd Psalm. Now, Perry, I know that you love the Psalms. It might be your favorite book in the Bible, for our, I, I think so. So explain yourself. How, how is it the I, Psalms are your favorite? I do love the Psalms, and it is my favorite book in the Bible. I, um, there was a period of time when I couldn't hardly read the Bible at all because I just began to have a lot of questions and confusion, and uh, I just didn't know what to do with the picture that I thought the Bible portrayed of God, particularly in the Old Testament. And the God that I had come to know in my heart was not... I I just didn't understand. But I came back to the Bible. I want to say I love the scriptures now because I see them in a very different way. I love all the scriptures, and I love the Old Testament. But the Psalms is the book. You know, the Bible teaches us about God. All those books, 65 books, teach us about God. But one book, we engage with God. Mm -hmm. And it is the prayer prayer book. book. It is the prayer book of the people of God. And it has been for 3,000 years and when I think about the fact that I am praying 3,000-year-old prayers, I mean, it just, it roots me. It grounds me. And in those very emotional prayers, the Psalms are, I have freedom to process my own emotions, to own up to my own emotions, to process them. And the safe place to process particularly dark emotions is with God. And it's just been a place of great healing for me. And I love the Psalms. All right. So the best Psalm, I think, the most famous Psalm, the most popular Psalm is Psalm 23, David's greatest hit. I won't argue with you there. (laughs) And so I thought that would be like a framework for our conversation that is somewhat reminiscing over 40 years, but also just testifying. So it starts out, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, if it's, if it's you and me together thinking about this and praying this, it's like Jesus is the good shepherd, and Jesus has been at the center of our lives. The I mean, that's, very center for years. Well, I mean, years. we met mm-hmm. at the catacombs, which was, you know, this Christian coffee house in St. Joseph. We met in 1975. I don't remember when we first met. I mean, I remember meeting you, but I don't remember what the date was. July the 12th. Okay, I said I knew, <laughs> I knew it was summertime. I knew it was summertime, and yeah. I met you at the catacombs. It was my first time at the catacombs. You'd been there for a while, and it was my first night there, and you caught my eye. And, uh, and then it took me a few months to mm-hmm. work up the courage to, to ask you on a date. Yes. Oh, my goodness, I was, I've never been so nervous. And uh, I called you up, and... And invited you to, well, see, for a date for us, I mean, we would go to movies later on, but I mean, at this point in our life, 
what was it? We, I would take you to the catacombs, the catacombs on a Saturday night, and then we'd go out to Pizza Hut afterwards. Yes, we would. But let me tell you, even this morning, I was reminded of something that happened <laughs> 45 years ago. Really? Yeah, because we've been going together for the longest time. Um, this morning I was getting dressed, and I was trying to decide between two pairs of shoes. <laughs> yeah, I know what story <laughs> you're going to tell. <laughs> and so I will tell a little story about our first, what I would call our half date. It wasn't our first date, it was our half I, date. I, I know what you're going to, yeah, I Because remember. when Brian called me on the phone, ostensibly to borrow a record album, and he Clever said... Clever of me. <laughs> yes. He said, um, yeah, I could meet you at the catacombs, and then maybe if you want, I could take you home afterwards. And so I was so excited. But I was to be picked up by my friend Rod and his girlfriend Christy um, as normal. And I was trying to decide what to wear. And I was trying to decide between two pairs of shoes. <laughs> it was a brown leather shoe or a blue, blue tennis shoes. And so I put one of each on. And then I heard Rod honk the horn. And I ran out the door. And I did not realize it until I was at the catacombs. So Perry. That I had on two thing. different shoes. And even <laughs> though it was November, I just had to take my shoes off and go barefoot the whole evening. But it was, it was sort of a sign of things to come. Yeah. Because, yes, that is very All right, So we went on that first date, and we went to Pizza Hut afterwards. And, wh and what did we have? What kind of pizza? See black olive and mushroom. Black. See, some couples have their song. We don't have a song. We got lots of songs. In fact, I made songs. you a playlist today of 40 songs. But Ooh. we'll save that for later. Ooh. Um, we don't have a song, but we have a pizza. We have a pizza. So if we see black olive and mushroom, we say, oh, they made our pizza. <laughs> yes, that's our pizza. And so, okay, so we got to get into this. So, so we, we went on our first date, and then we got married in May of 1980, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Then next May, a year later, Caleb was born. So I always think of Caleb, our oldest son. I always think of him as like, yeah, that's, that's the age where life is. Mm -hmm. And so... So we were married May 1980. Caleb was born May 1981. 81. And Word of Life Church starts in November of 81. Mm -hmm. So in a span of 18 months, we got married, had a baby, and then had another baby. <laughs> we gave birth to our problem child, <laughs> Word of Life Church. No, not really. You're not, you're not a problem child, but <laughs> sometimes you are. Um, no. So... so, so, so <laughs> That's, you know, I mean, would people counsel people to do that? No. Get married, no. have a baby, start a church in 18 months? No. Oh, and you but forgot we, I went to nursing school. Oh, started and, nursing and started school. nursing school. Yeah. Uh, but we didn't read any books. People ask me, Pastor Brian, I, I, we're getting ready to launch a church. Uh, how, how, do you have any counsel? I said, what would I know about it? <laughs> I only did it once and more or less kind of accidentally and did everything wrong. So what would I know about it? So... Anyway, so, but here, I want to return to this, though, that through it all, Jesus has been our, our shepherd, our guide with us, never forsake. That, that, can sound like, that can sound like religious jargon on a Sunday morning. I'm telling you, it's stone cold truth that no matter what, ups and downs and mm -hmm. ins and outs and good times and bad, Jesus has been there with us as our shepherd. Jesus. So, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You could take that a lot of ways, but, you know, when we were first married, and for a good while after, we had no dinero. My salary was $90 a week, and I didn't always get it because the church didn't always have it. <laughs> That's a poor church that can't afford to pay the pastor yes. $90. But it is true. I mean, it really yes. happened. Yes. So. But God has always been faithful. God always provided. And I remember the time, oh, probably somewhere just in the 83, 84, we were so poor. And we'd had pancakes one night for dinner. Pancakes are cheap. Yeah. And I remember um, washing the dishes, had a, had a you know, stack of plates, three plates for Brian and me and little Caleb, and the stack of plates. And as I, as I um, turned over a plate... Two twenty-dollar bills floated <laughs> up from the dishwater, and it was so incredible and beautiful. And we have no idea where they came from, 
but they were God's it, provision it's, it's for It's like us. I told the story on my BZ's Basement Tape on books how we don't know how the divine conspiracy, the book, showed up in our house, but it did. And we don't know how those mm-hmm. two $20 bills got in the mm-hmm. dishwater, mm-hmm. but they were there. And, and two $20 bills did not solve all our financial problems. No, but at that time it was a help. It was a real help, and it was just such an encouragement. It was just that the, it was more than the money. It was the sense of God's going to take care of us. Yeah. Just a reminder of God's love and mercy and grace and faithfulness. And we've lived that way. I mean, I don't know if people like hearing this, but I don't care. Um, we, we've always tithed. We have always tithes. Always. We have always more than tithes. Always more than tithes. And we've never thought about doing anything other. I mean, income comes in. What's the first thing you do? Mm-hmm. You honor God with it. Mm-hmm. People say, well, do you still believe in that tithing stuff? Yes. Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because my dad taught me this. Mm-hmm. And he was taught it by his dad. He was taught it by his aunt. And it goes back all the way. I think mm-hmm. Abraham taught yeah. somebody. And here we are. It, it's a sign of the faithful covenant that we have with our God. Uh, yeah. Amen. And God and has people say, well, you don't faithful. be legalistic about the time. Of course not. You can always give more. Amen. <laughs> okay. Amen. We have not wanted. No. And, and we're sitting here in this, it's kind of lonely. We're sitting in, in this enormous sanctuary. Um, we moved in here in 96. Um, that, was a, that was quite an ordeal. That was quite an ordeal. And there was a period of time when we just did not know how we could possibly finish this I building. Know. There was a, a summer, I think it was the summer of 95, when just all construction had ceased. We had Because all money had ceased. Yes, we had this big shell of a mm-hmm. building open. But even the, uh, the interior had no concrete poured yet. Yeah. And it was open to the outdoors. And so we, have, we had this pond. It was right down there. Right down there. Right in the center of our church. And we came in here one day and there were ducks. <laughs> there were ducks swimming in our pond. It was the pond. most discouraging thing. <laughs> You're trying to build this big church building and you've got a duck pond. Yes. World's yes. most expensive duck pond. Yes. It was a hard time. And I remember we. Um, we drove to Oklahoma to meet with a ministry couple that yep. we knew, Bob and Cindy, and they were business people, and they knew about money. And we money. weren't. That's why we went to We were not. We were not <laughs> business people. We didn't know much about money, but we were trying to find a way to, to get more financing and come up with some creative ideas. And so we drove all the way to have dinner with this couple. Yep. And um, I remember we shared our situation and said, hey, do you have any advice? Do you have any, you know, can you tell us? how to do it. And I remember they both looked at us and they said, wow, we have absolutely (laughs) no idea what you could possibly do, but we believe in God and we believe in you. They told us they believe in God and they believed in us. That was a big deal when they said they believed in us. And that it was going to be so exciting to see what God did and how we were finally able to finish this building And it was the truth. It was so exciting. But I remember driving home from Oklahoma thinking, we did not go, we did not get what we went for, but we got something better. I mean, our our hearts were uplifted and we had this shot of faith. Just a word of encouragement from somebody we trusted that said, you're going to, you're going to do it. We believe in God. Well, they, and we actually, what they in you. said was, "You're the kind of people that'll find a way. You're, you're the kind of people that you'll succeed." Mm-hmm. And throughout our marriage, we've always had this this mantra: "Faith will find a way." Faith will find a way. So you don't despair. You don't give up. You just keep going. So, the Lord is my shepherd. That's been true. It's still true. It's always been true. Jesus is the good shepherd. I shall not want. We've had challenges, but the Lord's always been there at the right time. Always came through somehow. Jehovah Nicka time. <laughs> That's, yeah, people's not going to get that, but okay. Jehovah uh, Nicka time. Some of you will see, get it. <laughs> see, Hebrew name for God, sort of. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me. He leads me. He leads me he beside leads still me. waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Sometimes I'll, I think of that a little bit like this. 
He leads me in the right paths because his name is faithful. Amen. You, you don't have to work. It's taking care of business is his name. And, uh, he, you know, as I look back, I mean, it's, it's funny because we talk about 40 years of marriage. I mean, that's, you know, it's t- today, it's not the 40th anniversary of Word of Life Church. That'll come up next year. Um, it's, it's our 40th wedding anniversary, yet our life and our marriage has been lived so yep. in concert, it's all the same inextricably thing. Mm-hmm. connected with mm-hmm. Word of Life Church, that for us to talk about our marriage is also to talk about the church, because it's all been together. I know they're not the same. I get that. But they have happened at the same time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's all we've ever done. <laughs> it's all we've ever done. So um, I, I want to say this. The Lord has always helped us find the right path. Mm-hmm. And the path you start out on, that is the right path to start out on, doesn't always stay the right path forever. People think, okay, here's where I start with Jesus. And so all, all I have to do is just stay on this path forever. Well, maybe not. Mm-hmm. Maybe that path comes to a dead end. Yes. And he leads Maybe me. that path doesn't really lead to where ultimately you want to go. Yeah. It, was the, it was the starting point. Yeah. You gotta it's, keep it's, moving. it's like those hikes keep in Rocky Mountain National Park. You know, there's more destinations than there are trailheads. Mm-hmm. And so you start at one of the trailheads, but then you have to make some decisions along the way. Do I go right or do I go left? And I, I, I feel I can very confidently say that for 40 years, Jesus has led us onto the right path, not without some backtracking and pulling out the map and compass and going, I think we got off here somewhere. I mean, that happens. That's life. Uh, but he's always been faith, faithful to lead us onto the right path because we've never stopped seeking. And so we start, I mean, you know, you and I, we're, we're, we're just grown-up Jesus freaks. We met at the catacombs, the, the center of the Jesus movement in St. Joe, and, and that was the path we were on. I put some old Jesus music songs on that playlist. I can't wait. Yeah, so I got some Paul Clark and got some Phil Kagey. Got some res band. That's a little bit for me, but I put a paint a picture because you like that song. Yes, I do. All right. So um, we start off with the Jesus movement, but that's that that path petered out after a while. I mean, if you said, okay, I'm just going to stay on this, well, it ends. It ends. You know, and so we had to find other paths. About 1985 it ended. Yeah, and, and so we have to keep going. Mm-hmm. And there's been several, you know, and, and times there's been some fairly, are you sure this is the path? And we'd pray and we'd see, yeah, this is the path. It doesn't seem like the path, but the witness is it's the right mm-hmm. path. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and follow mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And um, you know what? We've never seriously gone very far down a wrong path. Yeah. When, we, when, when it became that, wrong, we would go, wait a minute, and we'd find a different way. That sense that the Holy Spirit was always there, always there beckoning, leading, All inviting. Right. All right. So, and I do, I, I, I do know a little bit about what you might want to talk about because I know this is a big deal. So they're in that little part of the, the uh, 23rd Psalm, there's that line, he restores my soul. It's in the context of being on a path, being led, mm-hmm. being guided. Sometimes it's mm-hmm. green pasture, sometimes it's still waters. But the sh- you know, that's what the shepherd does. The shepherd leads the sheep, he's leading the sheep. Mm-hmm. And along that way, there is a restoration of the soul. My soul, you restore my soul. Mm-hmm. So talk mm-hmm. about that. Well, I'll talk about the Camino de Santiago. And most of you know that Brian and I walked 500 miles across Spain on an ancient pilgrim path, and we did it in the fall of 2016. For the first time. For the first time, because we've done it since then. But you know, it was, it was God's provision for us. It was God's way to restore us. It came, the Camino came to us at exactly the right time. Yep. We were both very, very weary. Mm-hmm very tired, very wounded. And we went on the Camino knowing that God was going to meet us there, but having no idea how or what. It was, our first, it was our first sabbatical. That's, yeah, that's one word to use. But it was our first break. Yes. I mean, I personally had never gone more than one Sunday without preaching. And there were very few Sundays that I didn't preach. A handful. 
maybe one a year for vacation. Uh, later on, early on, there weren't vacations. Mm -hmm. Vacation. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Vacation? Who, who, who has time for a vacation? <laughs> who has money for a vacation? Um, but we then took a seven-week break. We weren't here for seven weeks, just like you haven't been here for seven weeks. <laughs> uh, we weren't here. And that was, a, that was the first time in 35 years at that point that we'd ever done that. Mm -hmm. And it did restore our souls. It restored our souls in a way that I still marvel over. Mm -hmm. There was mm -hmm. certainly, can I say magic involved? Yeah, you can say that. Can I say the Holy Spirit just so took us under, under his wings and shepherded us. The good shepherd was there leading us. It was just beautiful. And we talk about our lives pre-Camino and post-Camino. We do. Because we came home so changed, so different, and so ready to throw ourselves back into the work. Mm -hmm. We weren't tired anymore. So I, I want to talk about this, though. So in 2016, we walked the Camino Francais, 500 miles. 2018, a little tune-up Camino. We won't go into all that. The Portuguese Camino, two weeks. A and then last year, last fall, 2019, we went back and did the big Francais 500-mile Camino. In 2016, when we walked that Camino, we got lots of blisters and our feet hurt and all that. 2019, no blisters. Our feet didn't hurt. And we were trying to, you know, why? When we were walking, especially as we were a ways into the 2019, last year Camino, we had no blisters and our feet don't hurt. We're wearing the same kind of shoes, same kind of socks. We haven't done anything different. And yet... This one is pain-free and the other one was painful. And then we, we talk about that. We, we well, we were just walking along and I just, I felt like the Lord showed me that we brought all the pain with us. All that pain in our feet, we brought it with us in our bodies, but that it was draining out. The Camino drew it out. Yeah, it, it was draining feet. out through our feet into that sacred path that mystical sacred path, something was happening. All that pain was coming out through our feet. And it's as if it had to hurt and that the pain itself mm -hmm. brought it the healing. <laughs> it did hurt a lot, but we finished. By the time we were finished, right. there was no more pain. In 2016, we, we, we ended without any blisters, without any pain. And then in 2019, we did the whole thing without any pain. Yeah, 2019, it was just a joy. A walk in the park. It was, it was a joy. <laughs> All right, uh, but sometimes, sometimes, you know, the journey through life isn't always a walk in the park. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you fear are no with evil, me. For you are with me. And um, that particular verse will always be the verse that I think about. 2012, when we went through a terrible illness with our baby grandson, who was just two years old. He yeah, it was our first grandson. Our first grandson, diagnosed with cancer at the age of two. And it was a very, very awful thing. He was very sick. Um, we knew there was a possibility we would lose him. We were walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And, you know people began to pray for us. And there was so much prayer happening for, for Jude, for our family, for us. And I felt, I felt that prayer. And I never knew before what it was like to feel prayer, feel the prayers of others in such a yeah. very powerful way. And I was, I received the peace that passes understanding in the midst of that horrible drama, that horrible time. I felt peace come into my heart, and I knew that it was a re as a result of all that prayer, the peace that passes understanding that the book of Philippians talks about. And that peace, that new impartation of peace, was something that I have kept with me forever. I should say that 
thanks be to God, little Jude was healed. He is 100%. He is well. There is, you know, the cancer was gone. We also knew at that time, we had this just absolute understanding that we didn't, Jude didn't get healed because we earned it or because we had more people praying or anything like that. It was just, it was just... The thing that happened, the faithfulness yeah, of God. Yeah, I mean, every time I tell this story, it's, it's a story that has a happy ending. But I know that so many people have a similar story, and it doesn't have a happy ending. Mm-hmm. And I always want to tell people, I want to stress that it, it isn't, the, oh, we've, we have the secret now. No, no. And we, we found out how to get God to do what we think God ought to do every time. It's not that at all. We're testifying that when we walked through the valley of the shadow of death, we were not alone. That Jesus was with us in the prayers of people. We felt them. They were with us. They sustained us. They carried us during that time. And if the unthinkable had happened, Jesus still would have been with us. And the prayers would have been even more important. One of the things I learned during that time, I mean, I was, I was already well established in, in the practice, the discipline of a morning liturgy of prayer. But it was during that time when my, emotion, when my emotions could run amok that having, a, having this discipline, this, this path, this structure, this habit. this habit of prayer that I could just you know, lean into, I saw how valuable that was. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we walked through the valley of the shadow of death in that sense, and the Lord was with us, we can testify. Uh, I'll stay on maybe for a little bit. A few more moments on some on a painful thought. Um, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Well, if we talk about you know the theme has been this journey and paths and being led. Everybody that knows much about Word of Life knows that beginning in two thousand four, we we began to walk some paths that were, in some ways, they were very ancient paths, but they were new for us, and not everybody was thrilled. Not everybody what he was willing to go down that path. And uh, a lot of people left. And that's okay. I mean, that's okay. I didn't like it, but I understand it. I get it. But then there were people that left, and, and, and friends became enemies. Because it wasn't enough. They just say, well, we don't think we can go down that path. They felt incumbent upon them to say, you know, and you're wrong, and you're a deceiver, and a, a mm-hmm. false teacher. Mm-hmm. And, and to send letters. And, oh, and send, send emails right before we go on vacation, and, mm-hmm. and just mean stuff. And so... When friend, I mean, if it's just an enemy, enemy, whatever. But it's when friends start acting like enemies, that can be very painful, very painful. Um, but I learned that, that Jesus won't allow you to focus on your enemy. He just kind of says, sit down and let's talk. Sit at the table with me. And, and, and if they want to, and they can join the table or they, maybe they don't. But we learn to sit with Jesus and we learn to forgive. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'm doing a very good time. That's the pain that we were being healed from mostly. Mostly. That we, mm-hmm. In 2016. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we are here. And I, I just I yeah. do, do want to tell people, we're not just putting on a brave face right now. <laughs> we're really healed. All right. So we're, we're well. Amen. And, uh, but, but when we were going through that and when friends were acting like enemies and sending us mean, and it wasn't always just church people. Sometimes it was other pastors or whatever. Um, that was painful, but Jesus stayed with us and sat with us, and we might have felt like we were in the presence of enemies, but Jesus is just saying, don't worry about that. Just This is the table I prepared for you. Mm-hmm. Eat mm-hmm. this, mm-hmm. read this, mm-hmm. imbibe this, drink this, absorb this. Don't, mm-hmm. don't worry, forget mm-hmm. about that. Just sit here at the table mm-hmm. with me. And I think about the fact that life is good and God wants us to enjoy it, And that particular passage of Scripture, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I always think about um, a beautiful picnic that God has laid out, Mm -hmm. and then I'm to sit down and enjoy. But I say, no, God, there's a problem over there, and there's a problem over there, enemy over there. And I can't enjoy this until you've solved all my problems, till you've made everything right. And God says, he just repeats the invitation no, I want you to sit down and enjoy this moment. Yes. This beauty. That's really good. What I've That's given really you good. right here in this mm-hmm. moment and the, let the problems take care of themselves and believe that at the right time, they will all disappear. Surely goodness and mercy. 
shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Mm -hmm. I, I can just say, I don't know. I expect goodness and mercy. Amen. I mean, Amen. I know there'll be hard times. I know there's valleys of shadow of death and, and enemies lurking in the bushes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But ultimately, what I really do, I don't go through life expecting, oh, when's the next valley of shadow death? You know, what enemy is going to jump out behind the next bush? I'm really not expecting that. I'm expecting the goodness and mercy of God. Amen. And as we look back over 40 years, it's been goodness. It is. Amen. It's been goodness. That's I exactly mean, we are right. very, very blessed, and it's been good. Not to say every moment has been good, but overall. Overall, it overall, becomes a tapestry of grace. A tapestry It all gets of grace. woven together in the right way. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, we're, about, we're at the end of the 23rd Psalm. We're about out of our time. We haven't really talked about marriage per se. We've told stories of our 40-year journey as a married couple. And if people ask me, you know, what's the success? What's the secret to staying married for 40 years? I don't know. Not getting divorced. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, there's, I, there's something there. You've got it. <laughs> I, I think it's 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 it, I don't have a lot of great profound counsel other than. Don't quit and be quick to forgive. Amen. A marriage is something you build. A soulmate is yes. not some you don't go out and find a soulmate. Oh, I found my soul. You. You find a person, you commit to them, and then they become your soulmate. Stanley Hirewall says you always marry the wrong person, which is his somewhat humorous way of saying... But we didn't. Well, <laughs> we didn't. I know we didn't. But, but, it, but if you go with the idea, oh, well, you know, Brian and Perry, just they, the stars lined up and they found each other, but you know, that didn't work out for me. And who, well, part of it is... Part of it is we, we, were, we grew up together. I mean, we went on our first date. I was 16, you were 15, right? And, and then we got married young, and we've just grown up together, and, we, and our vows meant something, and now I'm starting to sound preachy, so I think I'll, I think I'll invite us all to come to the table of the Lord. Amen. Well, let me say just a little, bit, right. a little bit about marriage. Um, Somebody said to me just a week or two ago, I bet you and Pastor Brian never fight. <laughs> oh, dear Lord. And it's like, oh, my goodness. I wish people didn't have that perception. Those people of... don't know me very well if they say that. Well, we both have some strong opinions. Both of us are, are neither one of us are wilty and lilies. <laughs> That's true. We both have strong opinions. And yes, we fight. And there are people who could testify to that truth. Yeah. I mean, because... They've seen us not get along. Um, I think, though, part of it is we try to fight like Christians. <laughs> we try to fight like Christians. Right, right. And we forgive. Amen. Forgiveness is the answer. There is no future without forgiveness. But there's something for me that I think is even a, a deeper wisdom that goes beyond forgiveness and it's acceptance. It's understanding People are who they are. Yeah. It's not my job to make Brian the best Brian he could possibly be. And I might not even know what that best thing is. I have my ideas, but just we need to accept one another for what we are, walk in lots of forgiveness, laugh, love, and be grateful. The best thing that you can do to work on your marriage is to work on yourself. Mm. Will you amen that? Amen. That's profound. That's true. Rock on, Perry.